Onska onti dewa wenoni ne nguanigura. Tana onti eti nu wiradu ne sungwa ya tison ne ohonda onwe sun a. Let us gather our minds together and send love and gratitude to all of the people, those gathered here, and especially to the Ohlone, on whose territory we stand, and our guests. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Ashhadu an la ilaha
if you will remain standing and read along with us to the words to gather us together, which are printed in your bulletin. And the table will be wide. And the welcome will be wide. And the arms will be open wide to gather us in. And our hearts will be open wide to receive. And we will come as those who trust there is enough. And we will come knowing we have a place. And we will come, beloved, and embraced. And we will come and free. And our aching will be met with bread. And our sorrow will be met with wine. And our loneliness will be met with community. Please be seated. We gather today on the words of an immigrant, an exile waiting on a border in hope. On this holy mountain, wrote the prophet of those exiles, on this holy mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all people a feast of rich food. Welcome to the 152nd commencement of Pacific School of Religion. My name is David Vasquez Levy and I have the privilege to serve in this community as president with a remarkable community, particularly those who gather here as students to be shaped as spiritually rooted leaders for social transformation. Join me in giving the class uh, our 152nd commencement a great round of applause. In front of you, but look at the ones behind you as well. <laughs> Graduates, before you and behind you, is a vision of the type of table you are called to set. A table that looks very different from most of the tables where you will sit in your life and ministry and work because seldom are our tables as beautiful as these. Seldom are our tables as diverse as this gathering on this holy hill that we are blessed to gather in. You can turn around and be seated again. Graduates, you graduate into a world that is in desperate need of you setting just this kind of table. A world increasingly marked by nationalism, fear, and a sense of scarcity that drives many to equate particularity with exclusion. And yet, on this holy hill, where a feast of education, of learning, of experiences has been set for us to be nourished, we are called to imagine not only what's wrong with the world, but what is possible. To join the words of Isaiah, that prophet of exile, that knows that there is a way in which on this holy hill, we too can set a feast of abundance for all people. As you graduate, we celebrate that you go into the world to set tables, at communion tables, in the name of one Jesus who sets the table for all. You go out into the world to set tables 
in front of city councils that require a better understanding of the kind of world that will make us well-being so that you can be resilient and embolden your heart and the hearts of others and that you continue to bring the skills you have learned here and those you have yet to learn to create a world where all can thrive. Thank you and congratulations, 2019 class of Pacific School of Religion. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Rabbi Daniel Lehman. I'm the president of the Graduate Theological Union. And it's wonderful to be with you this afternoon and to bring greetings on behalf of the GTU, its board, faculty, students, and the entire consortial community to this wonderful commencement ceremony. I want to extend our heartfelt congratulations to the graduates. And I want to give thanks and gratitude to your president, David Vasquez Levy, who's been a partner for me during this first year of my presidency and helping me to, first of all, understand the complexity of intra-Christian reality. That's relatively new for me. I thought we had complexity within the Jewish community, not even close. But he's been really a wonderful mentor and guide through this first year, and I'm looking forward to working with him for many years to come. I was in synagogue yesterday for the Jewish Sabbath listening to the scriptural reading. It was taken from the book of Leviticus and included chapter 25. And in verse 10 of chapter 25 of Leviticus, we have a famous verse famous because part of it is engraved on the Liberty Bell. It reads as follows, And you shall hallow the fiftieth year, and proclaim liberty throughout the Lamb. Ukratem dror ba'aretz lechol yoshveha. You shall proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants. It shall be a jubilee for you, and you shall return every person to his or her possession, and you shall return every person to his or her family. Now we know the part of the verse that's on the Liberty Bell, proclaim liberty throughout the land, but we often forget what comes before and what comes after. What comes before in this proclamation of the Jubilee year is the fact that the Jubilee year begins on the holiday, the holy day of Yom Kippur. The shofar, the ram's horn is blast on this most holy convocation and that begins the Jubilee year. And it's important to note that the concept of liberty is connected in this verse to the concept of holiness, to the sacred. And Yom Kippur is a day of atonement, of introspection, we need to understand, and you religious leaders who are about to go out from this most holy hill, need to embody the concept that liberty is ultimately rooted in the sacred, in our sense of the divine image which every human reflects. We need to root liberty in the concept of introspection, of self-reflection and criticism, which is part of that process of atonement an expiation. But then what comes after that famous part of the verse on the Liberty Bell is that people must return to their land, they must return to their families. The Jubilee and the sabbatical years in the biblical legal system were a way to deal with economic disparity. In agrarian societies, if you accumulate land over periods of time, over decades, you acquire wealth at the expense of others whose land you bought. On the Jubilee year, the land is returned. It's a way to control the ever-widening gap. And we in this society need to learn from that Jubilee and understand there is no liberty without economic justice, there is no liberty without reducing the economic disparities 
which confront us here in very, very powerful and disturbing ways. And finally, the verse says, not only do you return people to their land, you return to them to their families. And we who have witnessed our own country separate families, we need to remember this teaching from the Jubilee year. And perhaps we need to inscribe the whole verse on a new Liberty Bell. <laughs> Graduates, my blessing to you is that as you go out to assume positions of leadership in whatever institutions and organizations and communities and congregations, that you go out from this holy hill and from specifically this specific school of religion with a sense of liberty rooted in religious introspection and the sacredness that is of the divine image, that you connect liberty with holiness, that you connect liberty with justice, that you connect liberty with the kind of wholeness that we need in our society between humans, economic wholeness, family wholeness, and ultimately wholeness of the spirit. Congratulations. be reading Perhaps the World Ends Here, a poem by Joy Harjo. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation, and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies teethe at its corners. They scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it. We make women. At this table we gossip, recall enemies and ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor falling down selves and as we put ourselves back together once again at the table. This table has been a house in the rain an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth on this table and have prepared our parents for burial here. At this table, we sing with joy, with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table while we are laughing and crying, eating of the last sweet bite.
from Isaiah 25, verses 6 through 9. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food. A feast of well-aged wines. Of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wines strained clear. And God will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the shadow that is spread over all nations. God, God will, will swallow, swallow up, up death, death forever. forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. And there will be no more weeping in the land. And the disgrace of the people God will take away from all the earth. For the, For the Lord, Lord has spoken. spoken. It will be said on that day, Lo, this is our time. We have waited so long so that we might be saved. This, this is, is the, the redemption, redemption for which we have waited. Let us be glad and rejoice in this salvation. Jeff Chang is an award-winning author, social historian, and cultural activist. He's the co-founder of Culture Strike and Color Lines, now serving as vice president of narrative, arts, and culture at Race Forward. He's both a scholar and a cutting-edge cultural activist and movement builder. His books are Can't Stop, Won't Stop, Who We Be, and most recently, We Gonna Be All Right. And when I look out, I think that could be true. If you've read Jeff's work, you know that he observes in unflinching detail some of the most painful, violent, and tragic realities of our social fabric. And yet, if you read closely, you will see that he offers us more than hopelessness. He asks us to stretch our capacity for empathy to embrace and exceed our own identities. He shows us the anguish, but also the necessity and the creativity and the love in the struggle. At PSR, I saw how in any given time period, cultural experience and current events have more effect on the theology and the ethics that we constantly reinterpret than those theological and ethical studies have on our culture and current events. <laughs> so Jeff Chang is one of our important sources. As we graduates give shape to the theology, ethics, and spirit that will serve and lift up our peoples, Jeff's scholarship and wisdom strengthen us and show us the courage that we will need. Please give a warm welcome to Jeff Chang.
Thank you so much, Eleanor. I'm, um, I'm just overcome with emotion this afternoon. And so uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to do this. Good afternoon. President Vasquez Levy, honored trustees, faculty, administration, and staff of the Pacific School of Religion, uh, beloved guests, families, friends, and most of all, the, 20, 000, the 2019 graduates of the Pacific School of Religion. It's an honor to be invited to, be, uh, to speak here today on this occasion of your graduation and your, your passage from this holy hill into a nation and a world desperately in need of your wisdom and your action for its caretaking, its healing, and its liberation. Congratulations. So as you know, I wrote this book in 2016 about race and resegregation. It was called We Gonna Be All Right. And the important thing to know is that it was written and published before the election. <laughs> Hence the title. But not long after it came out, I was talking with my good friend, uh, Davey D, who I think is the greatest hip-hop historian and journalist working out there. And he's been documenting the links between the Black Panther Party and the Black Oakland dance scene, which, if you didn't know, is the source of so much of actually what we call hip-hop dance. And so he's talking to this elder about what the role of dancers was for the Black Panther Party. And so the elder told him about these rallies that they do in West Oakland and East Oakland. And at these rallies, they'd be giving out free groceries. They'd set up health clinics. Uh, they'd set up a stage where a band would then play, maybe the Lumpin', which was the Black Panther's funk band, uh, or a band by the strange name of the Grateful Dead. And the dancer's job, this elder told Davey, was to get the party started. So after the speeches, after the groceries have been given, after the kids have been given, given their shots, the band would start playing, and the dancers would form a, a cipher in front of the stage. And Davey would ask him then, well, what happened at that point? And this elder said, well, when the band locked in and the crowd got moving, what was happening, what they were trying to achieve, was this feeling of all rightness. And that's when I fell out of my chair. I was like, that's what they called it? And Dave said, yeah, that's what, that's what this elder told me. And so hearing Dave describe this continuity, right, uh, between politics and aesthetics, between generations, between movements, between the, the people then and the people now, to think about how in the streets young people in 2015 would, pay, would play a Kendrick Lamar song and chant, I messed up, homie, you're messed up. But if God's got us, then we're going to be all right, all right? And to hear this story made me feel lucky to do what it is that I do, to be able to hear and tell again of hope in history and in history hope. All rightness describes this transcendent moment when each person in their infinitely human ways is moving in their own bodies, and yet they're also moving together. Right? They're literally rhyming movement with movement. And so within this notion of all rightness is the development of a sense of well-being, of belonging, of engagement, of purpose, of justice, of joy. And it's simultaneously an individual feeling, but also one of connection. It has to be shared with others. You can't do it alone. You don't do it alone. So what the elder was giving Davy and us is a way to understand our own freedom movements. We can think of all these pieces as part of this restorative whole, right? The, the groceries, the free groceries, the health clinic, the speeches, the music, the dances, the people, their conversations, and their emotions, what they do with their body and what they do as a body. It's not random, right? It's imbued with truths that extend beyond time and space. And so today, we gather to celebrate your achievement, to take stock of your journey here, and then to send you forth. And your time here has been marked by a sense of growing divides. You can't but have a profound sense of the chaos that rages beyond the solitude of this holy hill. You can't but have developed a, developed a, a deep feeling for the safety and the sanctity and the sanctuary of the spaces that you need to make for yourselves, for each other, for the communities, for the world. You know that outside of here is segregation and brutality. 
that the challenges we face are as real as separated families, stolen lives, the sixth extinction. And so you've shared food with each other. You've broken bread, you've exchanged ideas, you've exchanged your dreams, your hopes with each other. You're aware that in this moment, you're called to lift up the values and honor the relations that run against the riptide of right now. To bring all that it's taken to set this table for each other out into the nation and the world that's hostile and dangerous. When I think of the table, I'm reminded of Malcolm X's famous lines in his speech, The Ballad of the Bullet. He said, I'm not going to sit at your table and watch you eat with nothing on my plate and call myself a diner. Sitting at the table doesn't make you a diner unless you can eat some of what's on that plate. When I first heard these words, it made me wonder what kind of host, right, would that be, right? <laughs> to, to make a setting at the table and then to proceed to ignore or insult or abuse the stranger in his midst. And yet these words resonate in our historical moment. All too often we're all feeling like strangers at this table of America. Our bodies and our rights are under attack. Our values, abundance, diversity, compassion, justice, connection with all living things, they're scoffed and dismissed. We're told by one man that he alone is our voice, that he alone can fix it all. And yet he sows division and hatred. It builds walls to lock in or lock out the innocent and the just. Given responsibility, he chooses rapacity. Asked to steward, he rages and ravages. He disengages with the world, turning away from immiseration and inequity. And yet, and yet we also live in a moment of emerging and converging social movements. Black Lives Matter and Me Too. The Women's March and the March for Our Lives the water protectors, the 99%, the dreamers, even as narratives of scarcity, of segregation, of hatred and death proliferate, we're building narratives, we're building tables of abundance, all rightness, mutuality, and grace. We show up, and we see many others showing up to protect each other and our shared resources, to grow our imagination and build a table for a new world. We're guided by the conviction of the Kumbayu River Collective and Grace Lee Boggs, who insist that our revolution is not meant to really just replace one power elite with another, but to affirm our humanity and move all of us towards becoming more engaged and more human. So on Friday night, I was at a punk rock concert. <laughs> and uh, after the first song, the lead singer stopped the music, right? He, wanted to lay down the new rules uh, for all of those folks who were in the mosh pit, right? He said, women in the center, or you can go to the back of the room or you can just leave. It was a reset moment, right? He, he, uh, he said that and then the band tore into this next song and this beautiful spectrum of genders exploded in a slam dance of joy and release, right? They just, a different kind of dance, but they were going for it. And later on, he brought up a bespectacled Latinx uh, young man uh, named Ali, who was wearing a t-shirt that said, Refugees Welcome. And he asked the crowd, Joe asked the crowd, are we all looking out for each other out there? Yeah. He's from England. So. And when we responded affirmatively, he told us our job was to carry Ali for the entirety of the next song. So for eight minutes, uh, we, we carried Ali from the stage all the way to the back of the ballroom and back for eight minutes. And I'm, I'm sure for him it was the crowd surfing experience of a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> but this is one of the big questions of the moment, right? Are we all looking out for each other, yeah? The biggest problems we face in the coming decades are how will we reverse this unfolding ecological disaster? And how will we all learn to live together? Both depend upon us looking out for each other, moving together towards all rightness. And so during your time up here on this hill, Solange, Right? She released an album called A Seat at the Table. And she told an interviewer that the title meant, I'm inviting you to have a seat at my table. And it's an honor to be able to have a seat at our table and for us to open up in this way and for us to feel safe enough to have these conversations and share them with you. And so at your table today, I feel that way, that it's an honor. 
And we should all feel the debt of gratitude to those who call us to be nourished at the table of change. As guests, we meet the grace of invitation with radical humility, with respect and hope in years. We recognize that this is a debt that we can't repay. And so when I speak of debts here, I don't mean the kind of monetary debts that we, but especially the poor, are increasingly burdened by in this dehumanized, financialized world where debts isolate us, produce loneliness and hopelessness. I mean the human debts that we owe each other for the generous gifts of compassion, wisdom, and grace. These are the debts that we incur every day in our journeys of becoming, for our becoming doesn't happen outside of belonging. And we experience these debts as appreciation, as connection, as attachment. They bind us to each other. But the debts that most folks are focused on in the world, right, the national debt or the student debt or the trade deficit, these are products of a narrative of scarcity. In our society, those who can leverage massive amounts of other people's money, they're valorized by society. They're called geniuses. They become presidential candidates, <laughs> right? And those who can't pay off their predatory loans, they're shamed. They're called irresponsible. They're called freeloaders. They're further dispossessed. The narrative of scarcity requires a zero-sum logic that there's only winners and losers, those in control and those who must be controlled. When the white nationalists marched in Charlottesville, they chanted, you will not replace us. And the murder at Christ Church, New Zealand, he also believed he was fighting the great replacement. And this narrative is not just one of, of racial hatred, it's one that projects hatred onto everyone else. It's a failure of imagination. It can't imagine humankind capable of doing anything but war and domination. That the best we can accomplish is to segregate people to rule over those who are less fit. Now Hannah Arendt has written of how this narrative isolates its true believers, consigns them to a deadly spiral of hatred and violence. She writes, isolation may be the beginning of terror. It's certainly its most fertile ground. It always is its result. Loneliness and isolation are not just the afterlife of terror, they are its beginning too. And so Arendt writes, totalitarianism is actually a release. She says, quote, a suicidal escape from reality. But we know that there's another way to understand the world. In June of 1963, the year of the centennial anniversary of the Emancipation Proclamation, as debates over the Civil Rights Bill across the nation were waging, Malcolm X gave a speech in which he summoned the fire of the Old Testament. He said, God must destroy the world of slavery and evil in order to establish a world based upon freedom, justice, and equality. And in this light, he spoke boldly about reparations. He said, a bill is owed to us and must be collected. And then two months later, Martin Luther King got up at the march in Washington, and he echoed Malcolm X. He said, 100 years later, the Negro is still not free. So we've come to our nation's capital to cash a check. These are not the lines that we talk about every day on Martin Luther King Jr. Day, right? He said, in particular, a promissory note in the form of the Declaration of Independence guaranteeing all Americans the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that was what was being called, right? He added, it's obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned, but we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. <laughs> Malcolm X and Martin Luther King, each in their own way, were calling the debt the society owes to those most harmed by injustice. But these are not debts that should shame or diminish us, that should reinforce inequity. Indeed, recognition of these debts, again, should bind us together. And making good on these debts redeem the payee and the payer, right? They move us closer to justice. In actuality, there's never going to be a moment when these notes can be fully repaid. Justice is a horizon line that we move towards. It's a destination that we won't reach until we give our last breaths and pass the work on to those still living. And ceremonies like this remind us that we can never make up the debts we owe to those who have made it possible for us to be here to fulfill our greater destinies. These are gifts that have been given of love, and these are gifts that many, many who we can't even begin to imagine, 
right now, right? We'll still be redeeming decades later, centuries later. Because unlike money, love is not rare. It's the most abundant resource. It's inexhaustible. The only thing that can limit it is our imagination. And so through love, through us looking out for each other, moving in time and space with each other, making a table that welcomes all, feeds all, uplifts all, we move to a narrative of abundance, or what the poet Seamus Haney called an economy of kindness. Cornell West reminds us that justice is what love looks like in public. Justice is about acknowledging the debts unpaid and moving towards the restoration of balance, what we Hawaiians call pono, right? Or all rightness. Beginning with those who have been harmed the most at the intersections of race, gender, and class. If we choose to live morally, we can't choose not to seek justice. Privilege is disengagement. Whether disengagement from the pain of the other or from a mutual disarmament treaty. Instead, we find ways big and small to make ourselves and those in the widening circle of our care more human, more whole, for this is the beginning of our way towards mutual freedom. And so here, the metaphor of the table takes on another meaning. It's the place where we foster truth-telling and reconciliation, where we ho'oponopono, right? Where we make peace and justice and all rightness. It's where we work out the answers to the question, how do we all get free? So Hannah Arendt once wrote, the raison d'etre of politics is freedom, and its field of experience is action. And she was writing against the tradition in Western liberalism in which freedom is conflated with free will. And as such, it's largely thought of negatively, like freedom is mostly freedom from, right? For the free will to act without constraint, it seeks freedom from oppression, freedom from censorship, freedom from debt, freedom from all that might inhibit the expression of an individual's will. So the liberal dignum, right? The less politics, the more freedom. But a conception of freedom that centers individual sovereignty above all else expresses itself most purely in the assertion of ownership of things and of power over others. It's a kind of freedom, Aaron writes, where man could reason himself out of the world. The freedom of one man or a group or a body politic can be purchased only at the price of freedom of all others. One man's freedom becomes tyranny for everyone else and requires violence to be maintained. And so it's not difficult to see how this idea is playing out right now on our national and world stage. But Aaron insists that the world's at stake. True freedom must be made by people together. And here she turns to St. Augustine and the New Testament for inspiration. The practice of freedom is a new beginning. It's literally a leap of faith, an engine of what she calls infinite improbability, of nothing more emphatic or less commonplace than miracles. She writes, it is not in the least superstitious, it's even the counsel of realism to look for the unforeseeable and unpredictable, to be prepared for and to expect miracles in the political realm. Right? And the more heavily the scales are weighted in favor of disaster, the more miraculous will the deed done in freedom appear. And our history is full of such miracles. Guy Karawan was a civil rights activist and a folk singer who popularized the song, We Shall Overcome. In the late 50s, as a young man, he began working at the Highlander Center in Appalachia, right? a place where organizers and musicians were building the social imagination for broad social change and deep racial justice. And Guy's job was to be the musical director. And so that meant, he said, when someone began to sing, I backed them up softly on my guitar so they get the courage and keep going. <laughs> and sometimes in sharing a song, people find bonds between themselves they never knew they had. He knew that the labor movement had a tradition of transforming an old song into something new, updated with words from the moment. It's a very hip-hop idea. <laughs> Back then, everyone knew spirituals and hymns, so he suggested that they update them. But some people were offended by the thought. These songs were about salvation. They belonged in a certain context. But then Bernice Johnson Reagan would be inspired to change a single word in a song, like, over my head, I see trouble in the air. And she changed it to, 
Over my head, I see freedom in the air. And she'd sing out a new miracle. And from there, every, everything, just everything came so easy because freedom and Jesus, they rhyme. They actually rhyme. <laughs> so someone could sing, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on Jesus. And they could sing it again, I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. And there wouldn't be anything lost and a whole new world would be gained. And when the Freedom Riders came soon after, the freedom songs that the movement sang multiplied because they all brought their songs and they shared them with each other and the songs and the hope spread. I think of the everyday miracles that brought me here to be in this moment with you at your table. I'm of Chinese and Native Hawaiian descent and I can trace my family back in the islands uh, seven generations. My Chinese ancestors arrived when the main language spoken in the islands was still Hawaiian. In 1896, the colonizers officially replaced Olelo Hawaii as a language of instruction with English. But by 1910, 57% of the population still couldn't speak English. So instead, one plantation worker said, the language we, the, the language we use had to be either pidgin English or broken English. And when we don't understand each other, we got to add some other words that would help to explain ourselves. And that's how this pidgin English becomes out beautiful. And I think about this quote when I think of words that we regularly use now, like intersectionality <laughs> or gender non-binary. Because just as food cures our hunger, right, language secures our possibility. But these workers, they were kept by the sugar plantation owners in ethnically segregated camps. But they worked together in the fields and their children mixed together in the schoolyards. So at lunch, they brought their two-tier cow cow tins, right, with them. They sat in a circle. They keep the, the tin of rice for themselves, and they put the other tin in the center. And that tin might have, like, Portuguese linguiça or Korean meat jun or limu poke. I'm getting hungry. <laughs> Tonkatsu or roast duck, right? And in the 1920s, a Japanese woman named Moyo Iwamoto started selling lunches to the dock workers at Honolulu Harbor from her push cart. And these were 50 cent plates and they had rice and macaroni and an entree, maybe Hawaiian style uh, beef stew or kalbi or pork adobo. And the rise of this urban mixed plate lunch prefigured a political revolution at the ballot box three decades later in which the Howley sugar aristocracy gave way to a rising local electorate of which my mother and father were a part. Because folks had forged an identity over the words and the food that they shared. And so now, as the graffiti artist from New Orleans B. Mike puts it, I am, and all of you graduates are, your ancestor's wildest dream. And I think of another small miracle, right? The, the humble Korean taco <laughs> created for the streets of Los Angeles by a Korean American, Roy Choi, and a Filipino American, Mark Manguera, who grew up too among Mexican, Salvadoran, black and white equals. And I wonder if it's a sign of a new beginning, a, a new politics and aesthetics. And I think of the ordinary miracles made by artists like Setu Jones, who in 2017 won the art prize for bringing 250 members of the Grand Rapids, Michigan community in a neighborhood stressed by gentrification and resegregation together to share a dinner meal at a 300 foot long table. Or Oakland's own People's Kitchen Collective, who carries on the Black Panther Party's free breakfast programs, food programs, and last summer fed 600 people at a table growing from the intersection at Magnolia and 28th, where Lil Bobby Hutton had been killed 50 years ago. Artists who transform pain into creation, ending cycles of harm and violence, making tables of welcome and nourishment and justice, who remind us that even in this divided moment, we might, be, we might be much closer to making tangible our freedom dreams than we realize. When Nelson Mandela was released from jail, the Irish poet Seamus Haney was inspired. He called the event a miraculum. Such was its power to him and it inspired him to finish one of his greatest works. It was a version of the Sophocles play, Philoctetes. And the hero of the play is a wounded warrior who's abandoned and left for dead by his army. And they only return to him when they realize they need his bow and arrow to win the war. So Philoctetes becomes a symbol for all those mistreated 
and marginalize. And each of the characters struggle with the ethics of how to move forward from legacies of trauma and violence. Haney wanted to retell the story to articulate his hopes for justice, reconciliation, and mutual freedom. And so if I may, I wanted to share his words in hopes that they may inspire you in the way that they've inspired me. And this is from A Cure at Troy, a version of Sophocles' Philoctetes. Human beings suffer. They torture one another. They get hurt and get hard. No poem or play or song can fully right a wrong inflicted and endured. The innocent in jails beat on their bars together. A hunger striker's father stands in the graveyard dumb. The police window in veils faints at the funeral home. History says don't hope on this side of the grave. But then once in a lifetime, the long forward tidal wave of justice can rise up and hope and history rhyme. So hope for a great sea change on the far side of revenge. Believe that further shore is reachable from here. Believe in miracle and cures and healing wells. Call miracle self-healing, the utter self-revealing double take of feeling. If there's fire on the mountain or lightning and storm and a God speaks from the sky, that means someone is hearing the outcry and the birth cry of new life at its term. After today, your journey takes a new turn, and so I wish you new beginnings. I hope for you many more gatherings like this one, held in joy, generosity, justice, and our rightness. Thank you for your invitation to your table this morning. May your journeys from here, wherever they may take you, always be full of abundance, fellowship, trust, grace, and nourishment. Thank you. Let us pray. <laughs> Holy One, who sets a table before us, the excitement and joy of this day surrounds us. How long we have prepared for this hour. As we taste and see your goodness in this moment, Remind us that it is not only our own doing that brings us here, for we are the result of a thousand loves. This love has surrounded us from our birth, even when we have not seen it. This love has been present in our work, even when we could not feel it. For this we give thanks. For the fresh taste of new understandings and all the insights that are now a part of us, we give thanks. For the sweetness of deep knowledge that has grown and formed over time, we give thanks. From the bitterness of hurts we have caused and wounds we have experienced, we ask for release. For the nourishment of community built as we ate together, marched together, learned together, danced together, we give thanks. From the moments we were not welcome, when the table was too small to hold our experiences, our insights, our struggles, we ask for release. For the banquet of our diverse vocations and extraordinary callings, we ask your blessing. For the hungry feast to which we are called in a world hungry for new dreams and visions, for love and justice, for the new day to dawn, we ask your blessing. Holy One, who welcomes us to the banquet, teach us to walk gently in your path of love, seeking justice, 
making peace, cherishing the earth and one another. Enliven our imaginations that we might see through present struggles to future newness. Embolden us with your love that we may live now as if the new has already come. In joy, we seek your blessing for all the tables that lie ahead of us and all the challenges and gifts they will bring. May we be the food the world needs. In the name of all that is holy and just and compassionate, we would pray and live in joy. Amen. In the fall of 2018, almost exactly one month from the Tree of Life Synagogue Massacre in Pittsburgh, someone came into our chapel and defaced both our pulpit Bible, which was a gift from the class of 2010, and entryway bulletin board with a swastika and anti-Semitic graffiti. The particular passage in the book of Psalms that was defaced ended with the words, Peace to Israel. We utilized the incident to draw together in solidarity across fates to observe the marked rise within the current political atmosphere in anti-Semitism and the promotion of white and hegemonic religious supremacy against people of any faith other than Christian and against black, brown citizenry and immigrants. That gathering concluded with the burial of the Bible in solidarity with the Jewish tradition of burying copies of the Torah or other sacred documents that were damaged or worn beyond continued usage. As an act of resistance, this year's senior class will be gifting PSR with a new pulpit Bible, which will be blessed in the beginning of the 2019-2020 uh, academic year. Funds will also be used to purchase an Our Bible app set to release this fall that offers at least 20 Bibles and more than 300 devotional readings, meditation exercises, articles, and podcasts for LGBTQ Christians and others who feel marginalized by mainstream Christianity. And those will be made available to CLGS and to the GTU library. And finally, any remaining funds will go to PSR's Shelter in a Time of Storm Fund, which provides emergency financial assistance to students in, uh, as need may arise for food, shelter, replacement of important documents, loss, theft, and the list goes on and on. Amen. We are now at a very significant part of our ceremony. Will the candidates for the Certificate of Theological Education for Leadership please rise and come forward. <clears throat> Mr. President, because this student has completed a designated one-year online program, of theological exploration and study, I am authorized to present them as a candidate for the Certificate of Theological Education for Leadership. In this case and in others to follow, it is understood that graduation is contingent upon completion of all academic requirements at the end of this academic year. I confer upon you the Certificate of Theological Education for Leadership with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereto, in witness thereof, I give you a certificate. Deidre Lewis Johnson. <laughs> the 
the following will receive their diplomas and certificates in absentia. Jean Erigero Alderx, Adrian Rossetti, Carla Jean Shirell, and Stephen C. Vogel. Will the candidates for the Certificate of Sexuality and Religion please rise and come forward? <laughs> Mr. President, because these students have completed a designated course of study with specialized training in sexuality, sexual orientation, gender identity, and religion, I am authorized by vote of the faculty and the trustees to present them as candidates for the Certificate of Sexuality and Religion. In the name and under the authority of the faculty and trustees of Pacific School of Religion, I confer upon you the Certificate of Sexuality and Religion with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereto. In witness thereof, I give you a certificate. John Atchison. Rowan Oliver Eckhart Quitham. <laughs> Samuel Neil Bird and Sharon Henry in absentia. Will the candidate for the Certificate of Spirituality and Social Change please rise and come forward? <laughs> Mr. President, because this student has completed a designated one-year immersive course of study, integrating theological reflection and spiritual formation with leadership for social change, I am authorized by vote of the faculty and trustees to present them as a candidate for the Certificate of Spirituality and Social Change. In the name and under the authority of the faculty and trustees of Pacific School of Religion, I confer upon you the Certificate of Spirituality and Social Change with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereto. In witness thereof, I give you a certificate. Sophia Jackson. Will the candidate for the Certificate of Theological Studies please rise and come forward? <laughs> Mr. President, because this student has completed a designated one-year program of theological exploration and study, I am authorized by the vote of the faculty and trustees to present them as a candidate for the Certificate of Theological Studies. In the name and under the authority of the faculty and trustees of Pacific School of Religion, I confer upon you the Certificate of Theological Studies with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereto. In witness thereof, I give you a certificate. William Scott Miller. Will the candidate for the degree of Master of Arts in Social Transformation please rise and come forward? <laughs> Mr. President, because this student has completed a prescribed two-year course of theological study that equips students to think critically about sociopolitical dynamics and reflect constructively on the role played by religion and theological traditions in movements for social change, I am authorized by vote of the faculty and trustees to present them as a candidate for the degree of Master of Arts in Social Transformation. 
In the name and under the authority of the faculty and trustees of Pacific School of Religion, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Arts in Social Transformation, with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereto. In witness thereof, I give you a diploma and cause you to be invested with a hood for this degree. John Atchison. Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Theological Studies please rise and come forward. Yeah. Mr. President, because these students have completed a prescribed two-year course of theological study, I'm authorized by vote of the faculty and trustees to present them as candidates for the degree of Master of Theological Studies. In the name and under the authority of the faculty and trustees of Pacific School of Religion, I confer upon you the degree of Master of Theological Studies with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereto. In witness thereof, I give you a diploma and cause you to be invested with a hood for this degree. Cheslin Amado. William Scott Miller. Rowan Oliver Eckhart Quitham. And the following in absentia, Colin Dominic Amado and Samuel Neil Bird. Will the candidates for the degree of Master of Divinity please rise and come forward. Mr. President, because these students have completed a prescribed three-year course of theological study, I am authorized by vote of the faculty and trustees to present them as candidates for the degree of Master of Divinity. In the name and under the authority of the faculty and trustees of Pacific School of Religion, I confer upon each of you the degree of Master of Divinity with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereto. In witness thereof, I give you a diploma and cause you to be invested with a hood for this degree. Sophia Jackson.
Eleanor Pease. Rihanna Shaw Robinson. Nikki Arnold Swindle. <laughs> Emily Emily Amy Sayal. Safue Logotala Letuliga Senoa. <laughs> I really didn't get to read his whole name. Marie Antoinette Wilson. And the following in absentia, Sharon Henry, Robert Herman, and Julian Allen Marbury Sharp. Will the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Ministry please rise and come forward. Mr. President, because these students have completed a prescribed course of graduate professional study that integrates research on praxis with theoretical analysis and theological reflection for the good of communities of faith with the presentation of a thesis, I am authorized by vote of the faculty and the trustees to present them as candidates for the degree of Doctor of Ministry. In the name and under the authority of the faculty and trustees of Pacific School of Religion, I confer upon each of you the degree of Doctor of Ministry, with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereto. In witness thereof, I give you a diploma and cause you to be invested with a hood for this degree. Bilal W.D. Ansari.
Marsha L. Ledford. Robert James McGrath. Donald Murrow. Robin Noel Tanner. and to Daniel Rodriguez Schlorf in absentia. Congratulations to you all graduates and would you join me in thanking the faculty and the staff for bringing you to this wonderful time and place. Dear class of 2019, congratulations. Congratulations on your achievement and for completing your journey here at PSR. For this valedictory charge, I'm pleased to bring some good news to you on the day of your graduation. And the good news is, you're not done. <laughs> yes, you have finished papers, I hope. You have completed your coursework at PSR. I also hope that. <laughs> and you are receiving a well-deserved diploma. As, and as a community, we celebrate you. This is, no, this is no small achievement. But the good news is that we are not done. Because the task and the gift of theological education is to wrestle with that which concerns us ultimately the mystery of life, the force of love, and the work of justice. This is a task to which we are called for life. So no, we can't be done with it because the work must continue and because as creatures of an infinite and holy mystery, we are not done. We are always becoming. Life in Seminary welcome you to this process of becoming, of becoming a spiritual leader. In these buildings, you have been challenged to become a different person. You have been invited to craft your soul in the pursuit of knowledge. And you have been charged with the task of working for justice. What I hope you have gained for your, from your time at PSR is the knowledge 
the passion and the skills to shape your life with an unapologetic desire to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So first, on behalf of this community, I, I would ask that you release the pressure of having to be ready, the pressure of having to feel fully equipped and fully adequate for what is next. Instead, please know that who you are is sufficient for what is to come. Because who you are, what brought you here, and what sustained you is what theological education is all about. Please know that you are a divine gift. On behalf of this community, I charge you, I charge us to stay alive and to take joy in life. The womanist scholar Emily Towns once wrote that for, for African American women, the greatest act of resistance is to live a long and joyful life. <laughs> yes, when structures of injustice are so massive and so crushing to those on the margins, survival is the ultimate act of defiance. So in the context of interlocking systems that oppress all of us, I charge you, stay alive. Your survival, your joy, and your refusal to give up will be your holy legacy. To echo the theme of this celebration, I further charge you and us to go and set a table for others. Make it as long as love and as wide as justice. Your ongoing theological formation must continue to take place around the table with good food and good friends. I hope you will continue to long for the nourishment of food and that you will continue to thirst for relationship and community. For it is, for it is around the table that we come to glimpse at the mystery of God. Over your time at PSR, you have probably walked through the memory lane in Holbrook. There you find photos and information of the 151 classes that precede you in this institution. I want, I want to welcome you to the company of these friends. May their legacy be a blessing to you. Please remember that your life, your ministry, and your work will be remembered in this place. Supporting the work that you do in the world is the reason this place exists. So I remind you of the good news. We're not done. On behalf of this community, I charge us to be humble about the things that we don't know, to be courageous about what we can know, and to be persistent in our pursuit of knowledge. I give thanks to God for this community, and I give thanks to God for the class of 2019. May you be blessed in the work that you do. Congratulations. Good afternoon, and congratulations to our 2019 graduates. My name is Angela Brown, PSR class of 2014 and an officer of the PSR board. Today, I bring you greetings on behalf of the PSR board of trustees. As a fellow alum, I welcome the class of 2019 into the circle of PSR alums and encourage you to stay connected through your time and talent. With the close of this academic year, we bid farewell to Doreen Allen, Executive Director of the Ignite Institute and Faculty Associate Social Entrepreneurship and Invocation. Dr. J.C. Lee, Visiting Assistant Professor of Practical Theology, Education, and Spiritual Formation and Director of Asian Pacific Islander Initiative and who ends his second year appointment as the Louisville Institute 
postdoctoral fellow. Dr. Felipe Maya, Assistant Professor of United Methodist Studies, Leadership and Theology. Dr. Inez Radzen, Associate Professor of Theology. And Dr. Rosita Schroeder, Associate Professor of Arts and Religion. We are grateful for your years of service to the institution and students. We wish you well in your future endeavors. We note with sadness the passing of several important members of our extended community over the past year. Liz Ann Bassam, PSR campus pastor. Hubert Locke, former trustee and former acting president. And Sheila Thompson, alum and trustee. During the fall 2019 semester, we welcome Johan Junker, faculty associate in theology and spirituality and art, and Joyce De La Rosa, assistant professor in the practice of ministry and director of community engaged learning. We want to thank Patricia St. Ange, who served as interim director of community engaged learning this past year and will continue as an adjunct faculty member. PSR welcomes back Dr. Randall Miller, faculty associate in the United Methodist Studies, Ethnics, Ethics and Leadership. And Dr. Sharon Finema, assistant professor of Christian education and director of worship life will go on sabbatical in the spring of 2020. <laughs> Lastly, I would like to thank our entire administrative team, faculty, and staff for your dedication and commitment to the mission of PSR. Also, a special note of gratitude to our students. For your presence and the special way you make this community stronger, you are the promise of the leaders we hope to see in the world. And we are grateful for the ways you are already creating tables as long as love and as wide as justice. This ends our 152nd commencement exercise. We will convene for the new academic year on September 3rd, 2019. We invite you to join the graduating class for the president's reception to follow in Duchemont Dining Hall. Congratulations to the graduates and God bless you all. Thank you.
Friends, continue your journey walking in love. Care for one another, care for the earth, seek justice, and make peace. God goes before you. Live boldly, celebrate, feast together, and sing. <laughs> 